Welcome to the Progressive Primitivist Podcast, where we believe that the only way to go forward in religion is to go back to the Bible. One of the most controversial subjects in Churches of Christ is that of divorce and remarriage, and especially what 1 Corinthians chapter 7 contributes to that topic. Does 1 Corinthians 7.15 grant an additional grounds for divorce and remarriage in addition to Matthew chapter 19 verse 9? Well, in the lecture that you're about to listen to, Dr. Neil Lightfoot, who served as a professor at Abilene Christian University and who passed away in 2012, he addresses that question in a very informative lecture. We hope that you enjoy. The number of persons present this afternoon, I think, is some key to your admiration for the scholarship of Neil Lightfoot, who's going to address us. For that reason, a whole lot need not be said, but it might be well to fill in a little on this man other than his scholarship. I vividly remember when I first met Neil, because it was in the same year and in the same place where I met my wife. That was in 1948 in Madison, Wisconsin. Now, you probably wouldn't connect Neil with Madison, Wisconsin at all. What was he doing in Madison, Wisconsin? Neil was in Madison, Wisconsin uh, after his years at Fried Hardeman, a couple, to be involved in a campaign in the, in the church in Madison. So Neil has actively participated in all phases of the life of the church. The next time I ran into Neil was in Waco, Texas in the fall of 1952. I was living in Iowa City, Iowa, trying to raise some money for a church building. So you stop to see everybody you know. And even though I didn't know Neil that well, I stopped to see him. He was preaching in a church in Waco and attending Baylor University. The next time I probably ran into Neil was in 1963 when I came to speak on the lectures here. Neil at that time had been five years a professor of New Testament here at Abilene Christian. When I came here to teach in 1967, I discovered that Neil was an elder at the South 11th and Willis congregation. So I think that side of Neil, if you don't know it, is very important. He's obviously a person dedicated to the work in the Lord's Church, and although his interests are scholarly, Yet he's been actively involved in the work of the church all the way through. You can read what Neil's topic is, or he can say something further about it. Uh, Last summer, Neil presented in some form the paper he's going to present today on 1 Corinthians 7. And you should know this, that when exams were over about the 10th of May, Neil started working on this paper And he worked all the way up, probably 10 hours a day, almost three months, on doing the best job he could do to try to determine what this passage in Paul means. I know it's a passage of concern to all of us in view of the crisis in marriage in our country. So it's my great pleasure to let Neil address you from his depth and length of study on this topic. He's going to speak about 35 minutes, and when he's through, we're going to have about 20 minutes for you to ask questions to get further clarification. So it's my privilege to present my colleague, Neil Lightfoot. Brother Albright indicated that last summer I was asked to present a paper on marriage and divorce And I chose especially the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, that was a paper that I presented at the National Christian Education Conference, in particular a gathering of scholars present on that occasion. And then later, uh, Dr. Bikin asked me if I would present the same paper today. And so... That's what I'm doing. If you want a copy of this paper, and a number of people have written me, and a number of copies have already been circulated since I gave the paper, but if you want a copy of the paper, it is in the lectureship book. And people were dealing with a a very difficult matter. 
And I urge you always in very difficult passages to really think uh, things through, and I would urge you to uh, get a hold of a copy of the paper, if possible, and to read the paper and think about it. We will have opportunity for questions. I think discussion is always good. Sometimes I have the problem of really understanding what the question is. I can hear the words, but sometimes the words do not really express what the questioner is really seeking. On the other hand, sometimes we have questions that are presented that uh, really are not uh, all that uh, uh, fair. However, I welcome uh, questions. I'm not sure how I'll be able to uh, deal with these questions. I readily admit there are a number of things, even after I've worked in this area for a good long while, there are a number of things that I don't have answers to. But after this paper, there will be time for some questions. I might mention the other difficulty of questions is sometimes you have a real good question. Uh, and sometimes off-handed answers are really not the best kind of answer to give. And frankly, I just rather say, I don't know, than to give a, a slipshod answer. And um, as I say, sometimes we really need to get off and think about these things. And I urge you to study this passage with me. So as I say, I'll read the paper just as I presented it some time ago. I'm particularly happy to speak on this topic, on this program. When I was first invited, it was difficult for, it was not difficult for me to think of number of, numbers of reasons why I should decline the invitation. I had not done any special study on marriage, nor on divorce and remarriage. Yet on further reflection, I felt that if there was any special qualification that I had, it was that I had not researched the subject thoroughly, that I had not written anything on the topic, and that, and that I did not have any stated position that I felt that I had to defend. I might add that I have sought to make this an independent research project. For this reason, I have purposely not read the main books and articles written by well-known brethren, many of whom are my very good friends. I did not want in any way to be influenced by their thinking. Helmut Tillicke is on the right track when he says that a text does not need simply to be quoted but rather it needs to be interpreted. This points to the necessity of exegesis, a critical study of a passage by which a text is made clear. And good exegetical principles so long neglected by us in the church especially must be applied to troublesome texts such as those concerning marriage and divorce. Since my time today is necessarily restricted, I want to focus on 1 Corinthians 7 and see if it is possible to cast some light on this extraordinarily difficult passage. 1 Corinthians 7 is central not merely because it is the earliest recorded New Testament teaching on divorce, but because, one, it contains key terms and concepts that need explication, two, it places side by side two possible divorce situations, and three, it presents Paul's manner of handling these possible divorce situations in the life of the church and by explicit reference to what Jesus taught. My procedure will be to look briefly at the background of 1 Corinthians 7, to sketch the main lines of Paul's thoughts in selected verses and then to examine more closely the points that are crucial for exegesis. 1 Corinthians is probably Paul's second letter to Christians at Corinth. He had written a previous letter. Notice 1 Corinthians 5, 9. 
And in the meantime, the Corinthians had written Paul and had asked him some specific questions. What these questions were, we cannot know with certainty. Paul, when first among the Corinthians, had probably conveyed on to them what the Lord had said about divorce, and perhaps also his sayings, such as, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, Matthew 22. Possibly also, Paul had taught the Corinthians, as he had the Galatians, that in the one body of Christ, there is neither male nor female, Galatians 3. Perhaps these and similar teachings had been seized upon by the proto-Gnostic super-spirituals at Corinth and had become for them a sort of religious platform as part of an ever-widening Hellenistic disdain for things of the flesh. What Paul writes, the Corinthians provides clues to their questions. They ask something like the following. First, is marriage a legitimate relationship, and should married people abstain from sexual intimacy? Verses 1 to 7. Second, are the unmarried and widows to remain single? Verses 8 to 9, verses 39 to 40. Third, what about divorce? Verses 10 and 11. Fourth, what about a relationship where one person was converted to Christ and the other remained heathen? Verses 12 to 16. Fifth, what about engaged couples? Should they marry or refrain from marriage? Verses 25 to 38. In 7 1, Paul begins to answer these questions. He starts with a statement probably found in the Corinthian, in the Corinthians letter to him. It is well for a man not to touch a woman. Paul expresses some sympathy with this view, especially on account of the impending distress and because the form of this world is passing away. Verses 26. To 31. But Paul makes it plain that marriage is equally acceptable to God, and that in marriage neither partner has the right to refuse sexual intercourse to the other. Verses 3 to 4. Husband and wife may abstain from intercourse, which some at Corinth seem to be doing. But this should only be a temporary abstinence, and that by mutual agreement. Verse 5. Paul emphasizes that he says this by concession and not command. Verse 6. That is, on this point, he is willing to make concession to the Corinthian ascetics on the condition that their sexual abstinence be brief and for purposes of prayer. When Paul wishes that all were as he was, this is not an expression of bias against marriage and sex. Rather, he expressly declines to judge others by himself. Each has his own endowment of grace, and one endowment is no greater than the other. Verse 7. Verses 8 to 9 are in line with the principles of the previous verses, now applied to the unmarried and widows. Verses 10 to 11 contain Paul's charge to the married, a charge which, he insists, is not his, but is the Lord's. Paul's command is reinforced by what Jesus taught on marriage, Mark 10 in parallels. The wife should not separate from her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. Here a slight problem surfaces. The Revised Standard Version distinguishes between separate, 
and divorce. This may reflect the fact that in Judaism, the husband had the exclusive right of divorce. A woman could leave her husband, but she could not divorce him. But this is hardly the place to attempt a discussion on separate and divorce. Suffice, suffice it to say that there is considerable overlapping of the terms in both contemporary literary and non-literary text. In the Corinthian passage at hand, the terms are practically interchangeable. 1 Corinthians 7.11 contains an important parenthesis. But if she does, that is, if the wife, if the wife does separate from the husband, let her remain single or else be reconciled to her husband. This is the parenthesis that R.H. Charles regarded as an interpolation, partly because, I think, Charles was not able successfully to resolve the problem of separate and divorce. Indeed, the parenthesis, the, the parenthesis supplies, I, I believe, the answer to his problem. For, one of the words, charisthe, here must refer to divorce. Else, why would Paul, uh, why would, would it say, let the wife remain unmarried? But what is the significance of the parenthesis? In it, Paul recognizes that even though the Lord strictly taught against separation of wife and husband, that the wife, presumably also the husband, nevertheless might, might violate this teaching. And if so, she must remain single or be reconciled to her husband. Marriage to someone else would close the door on reconciliation. Paul proceeds to deal with a situation not addressed by Jesus. To the rest, I say, not the Lord. Verse 12. Paul, speaking in his own name, is conscious of making an important apostolic deliverance. I say, not the Lord, is not a contrast between the authoritative teaching of Jesus and his own unauthoritative, uninspired teaching. Paul's manner is emphatic, as shown a few verses later when he says, This is my rule in all the churches. Verse 17. To the rest can only mean the others not so far named. Now notice the structure of the statements, each introduced with dative plurals. To the unmarried and to the widows, verse 8. To the married, verse 10. To the rest, verse 12. In other places, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul uses this expression, hoilopoi, for unbelievers. Here the context makes it clear that the rest refers to so-called mixed marriages where a believing partner is married to an unbeliever. If the unbeliever is willing to live with the believer, the believer should not divorce the unbeliever. Verses 12 and 13. The believer should never initiate divorce. Instead of the believer becoming defiled by such a relationship of believer married to unbeliever, the opposite is true. The unbeliever is sanctified in connection with the believer. Verse 14. Here sanctification is not that of salvation through Jesus Christ. Compare 6, 11. But a sanctification of relationship. Somehow the believer sanctifies the relationship in mixed marriages. On the other hand, suppose the unbeliever is not disposed to continue with the believer. If the unbelieving partner desires to separate, karidzatai, let him do so, karidzatho, In such a case, the brother or sister is not bound, dedulatai, verse 15. 
This is verse 15. We meet here again the word charizo, which at least in verse 11 denotes divorce. Verse 15 probably has the same sense, to separate by means of divorce. In verses 12 to 13, where the unbeliever wishes to remain with the believer, Paul is very decisive. He employs the imperative, let him not divorce. In verse 15, Paul uses the permissive imperative, let him depart. Paul has no way of making demands on the unbeliever. He speaks only to the believer and says, let the unbeliever be gone. Under these circumstances, the Christian husband or wife is not bound. These verses pose a bewildering maze of exegetical difficulties. I want to focus attention on some of these by asking a few questions. First, does 1 Corinthians 7, 10 to 11 refer to the married in general or specifically to married believers? A good case can be made for the viewpoint that though Paul is writing obviously to married Christians at Corinth, the principles here are far-reaching and apply to all marriages. Paul stresses that it is the Lord's command. And did not Jesus in his teachings on divorce go all the way back to creation and say, from the beginning it was not so, and also the two shall become one flesh? Do these statements have a bearing only on marriages where both mates are Christians? Now, it seems unquestionable that Jesus' declarations on marriage in the beginning apply to all marriages. It is God's will, for example, that a man leave father and mother and become one with his wife. This applies to all men. But this does not change the fact that 1 Corinthians 7, 10 to 11, in these verses, Paul is speaking specifically to married believers. And further, that Paul applies and restricts Jesus' teachings on divorce to married believers. I use the word restrict, for Paul does restrict Jesus' teachings if on such as mixed marriages, Paul says that he has no teaching from the Lord. Second, how is 1 Corinthians 7 connected with the teaching of Christ? Well, this has already been suggested, but I want to explore some other aspects of this question. In recording Jesus' teaching on divorce, it is Matthew alone, chapters 5 and 19, who has the exception clause, except for porneia, that is, sexual sin. It may be that Mark and Luke are dealing with lesser causes of divorce than sexual sin. And so they depict Jesus as simply forbidding divorce. Matthew's exception clause has been explained variously as an unhistorical statement, as an editorial comment, as a gloss, and so forth. And here we're dealing with views of people that do not approach Scripture exactly as we do. But these are different uh, possible ways that this has been dealt with. But it is unnecessary now to explore these hypotheses. According to Matthew, the Pharisees ask, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Matthew 19.3 Jesus answered that... Parnea, sexual sin, is the only cause, fits the occasion of the question raised by the Pharisees. I previously used the word restrict to describe Paul's use of Jesus' teachings on divorce. Paul does not lessen the force of Jesus' teachings. He simply restricts their application. In effect, Paul says 
that Jesus did not cover all particulars having to do with divorce. Jesus often taught by stating a principle in its most extreme form without indicating how the principle is to be applied in concrete situations. Do not swear at all. Give to him who begs from you. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door. All of these, and there are many others, are principles which, though understandable in context, are later explained by apostolic teaching and practice. Even Jesus' teachings on divorce illustrate this. While Mark and Luke report Jesus' teaching without qualification, no exception clause, Matthew makes clear that Jesus was not against all divorce. The fact is that in Matthew... There is additional teaching on divorce not found in Mark and Luke. Matthew may well be including a saying of Jesus made on a different occasion. This could even be, even be termed a Matthean interpretation, quote, an inspired interpretation to be sure, but an interpretation or explanation, nevertheless. Now, in the same way that Matthew supplements Mark and Luke, Paul gives additional teaching to what is present in the synoptics. I say, that is, the Lord did not give teaching on mixed marriages. Need we emphasize that this additional teaching of Paul is as binding and authoritative as anything in Scripture. Third, what does Paul mean by the expression, not bound? The Greek phrase, u dedulatai, though it literally means not enslaved, is, of course, to be understood figuratively. But to what does the figure of enslavement or not enslavement refer? Although there are numerous opinions, I will mention only those that contextually seem to have merit. One, the believer is not bound to oppose the divorce of the unbeliever. Here stand Robertson and Plummer of the International Critical Commentary, and presumably also C.K. Barrett, he says, not enslaved, that is, to a mechanical retention of a relationship the other, part, the other partner wishes to abandon. A variation of this is that the believer does not seek reconciliation. Two, another explanation that's given to not bound. The believer is not bound by the Lord's saying, against divorce. If the heathen breaks off the marriage, the Christian is to accept it. The Christian in such a case is not bound like a slave to the Lord's saying. This is the view of Furster in the respected theological dictionary of the New Testament. Three, the believer is not bound to the obligation of evangelizing the unbeliever. Verse 16 asks, Wife, how do you know whether you will save your husband? Husband, how do you know whether you'll save your wife? Opinions are mixed whether this is an expression of optimism or pessimism concerning the possible salvation of the unbeliever. Taken pessimistically, Paul is saying that the believer is no longer bound to convert his mate. For he asked, how do you know whether you will be able to save him anyway? Four, the believer is not bound by the marriage contract. If the unbeliever deserts 
or divorces the believer, the believer is released from the marriage bond. The marriage is dissolved. This is the view of the majority of commentators. McKnight, Hodge, Meyer, Stauffer, Murray, Herring, Coiner, to name only a few. And this is the view that I adopted only after preparation of this paper. It is the view, I think, that meets the linguistic and contextual demands of the passage. A, under this, not bound to the marriage bond, fits the, the broad context of chapter 7, and the subject of chapter 7, as you know, is marriage. B, not bound to the marriage bond, fits the immediate context of these verses, these verses on marriage ties. In such a case, literally in such cases, the brother or sister is not bound. Verse 15. Cannot mean any less than in other cases the believer is bound. In what cases? The context suggests the answer. If the unbeliever agrees to continue the marriage, the believer is bound. Go, go back to verse 13. If the unbeliever does not agree to continue the marriage, the believer is not bound. And then C. Not bound to the marriage bond meets the necessary linguistic requirements. It's true that duloo in other places in the New Testament is not used of marriage. But only one thing determines meaning, and that is context. Not lexicons, not other passages, only context determines the meaning of a word. And the context here argues that below refers to marriage. In another context, 1 Corinthians 9, 19, edulosa from duloo is the opposite of free, eleutheros. And in still another context, 1 Corinthians 7, 39, dedicai from deo is the opposite of free. From this, one might conclude that duloo and deo are equivalent in meaning. I think they are. But in the final analysis, duloo means what it means only in the context of 1 Corinthians 7.15. It is superfluous to comb the territory for proof on the origin and our connection of duloo and deo, duloo enslaved, deo bind. The etymology of a term does not explain Paul's use or non-use of it in a given context. Now a word on the tense of not bound. The dulatai is the perfect passive indicative. The perfect ordinarily denotes past action with a continuing effect. The, the dulatai thus has the force, has not been bound, and is not bound. To argue from this, however, since the believer has not been bound, that Paul here is not speaking of marriage, is a fallacious argument. It makes the expression, in such cases, Paul's expression a little earlier, it makes that expression meaningless. For as we have noticed, if in such cases the believer is unbound, there must be some cases where the believer is bound. 
Why then does Paul use the perfect tense? In context, when the unbeliever departs, from that very moment, the believer has not been bound and is not bound. The marriage is broken up. Reconciliation is scarcely a possibility. The believer is free. So this means that the believer has the right to remarry. Paul does not say this. He does say that widows, though they'd be better off to remain single, may marry only in the Lord. Verses 39 and 40. Because Paul does not mention remarriage in verse 15, does not mean, however, that under different circumstances where the impending distress, verse 26, is not present, the believer must remain single. If he is free, he is free to take whatever course of action he wishes. But if he marries again, he should marry only in the Lord, a principle that should be followed in all marriages that involve believers. There are other questions of interest. If in some cases a believer is not bound, it seems there would be cases where an unbeliever might be no longer bound to an unbeliever. Well, this has implications for some of the problems about baptizing divorced persons. Where there is no biblical teaching on specific cases, there is no alternative except to follow the guidelines of Christ and the apostles. I close by emphasizing that Paul's instructions in 1 Corinthians 7 in no way opens the door for believers to practice divorce. Christian husbands and wives who are truly seeking to please God can have a successful, lasting marriage. The Christian at no time will seek to break up a marriage. But if the unbeliever forces the issue and leaves, the believer is free. Thank you very much, Neil, for your meticulous work. We're now ready to start the question session. Bill Blackburn and Eddie Sharp, both ministers of this congregation, have they're wired for sound with a cordless mic. Uh, if you would like to move toward the aisle in order to speak into the microphone, would you do that? We'll take your question, and then I'll repeat it, and we'll get Neil's response to it. All right, who's first? All right, right there, Eddie. I'd like to ask concerning the word unmarried in verse 8. Um, since the context can define a word, it's the same word used in verse 11, unmarried. Is it probable that this is talking about a Christian who had previously been divorced, uh, an unmarried person as opposed to a never married person? All right, in 8 and 11, is the reference unmarried to someone who's been divorced or someone never married? In verse 8, we have simply to the unmarried and the widows, I say it as well for them to remain single as I do. And uh, then, uh, what is it, verse 11? Um, if... Uh, if she does, we're talking then about a person uh, who uh, divorces her husband. Let her remain single or else be reconciled to her husband. Um, I don't see the word unmarried there. All right. Okay. Just, just a matter of how it's rendered then. Uh, I think that uh, the very fact that uh, verse 8 has a separate unit, and it's dealing with the situation um, uh, apart from what follows in 10, and 10 and 11 seem to be apart from uh, 12 following, we're dealing with a different situation. I cannot comment on uh, what all would be included in the unmarried other than apparently what Paul goes on to discuss in verses uh, 
2526, uh, where he's dealing with people that aren't married, engaged couples. All right, Bill has a question over here. In regard to baptizing a divorcee, uh, in view of the fact that we are coming out of 1 Corinthians, uh, it was addressed to the saints in Corinth, the Church of God, those who were called, who had called on the name of the Lord. In that same letter, Paul, in the fifth chapter, verse 12 and 13, asks the question, what business is it mine to judge those who are outside of the body? I wonder what implications that would have on our discussion. All right, what implications? It's 1 Corinthians 5, 12, God judges the outsider have to do with the, the question of divorce. Perhaps you see something here that I do not. I really don't think it's related to our problem here in 1 Corinthians 7. You want to ask another question, a follow-up question on that? Well, in your last page in the, in the book, you mentioned something about baptizing divorced people. Uh, maybe I can clarify by saying, uh, in view of what the scriptures do say about God judging those who are outside, then what about this practice in our brotherhood of refusing, some people refusing baptism to people who they consider questionably married? Uh, I think it does have a bearing on what we're saying because in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, these discussions only apply to marriages that involve at least one believer. There's no mention at all about uh, marriages that are outside of the church altogether. I don't know whether it would be necessary for us to repeat that or not. Is it necessary? Uh, uh, Tom? Uh, I don't think it has a bearing because we're dealing with a different context. I see what you're talking about. We, we uh, really have problems, people, when we take one statement in, a, in a, dealing with another problem in a different context and say, well, you know, this is dealing with this problem here. It's not really dealing with that problem. Now, commenting on the practice of uh, brethren in refusing to baptize certain people that may de be divorced or whatever, I, I really uh, I can't comment on the practices of others. I just have to uh, study the scripture and I make up my own mind as to uh, how a particular case fits the patterns that we may have in scripture. And uh, brethren are obviously doing different things about this, and we can't really, you know, make a rule that will we'll change that. Thanks. I believe Eddie has someone back. Do you? I'd like to ask a question concerning the uh, those that uh, are unbelievers. Okay, we have that context where they have one believer and an unbeliever, and the unbeliever wants out. My question has to do, is it possible that this unbeliever, an unbeliever at one time had been a believer, repudiated the faith, and then wants out of the marriage and out of Christianity altogether? Can that unbeliever have been a former believer? All right, the question is, is it possible for one who has been a believer to become an unbeliever and then become a believer again? And then the question of, of uh, that person in marriage with a believer, can this affect the whole question? These questions get more involved as they go, I think. <laughs> Uh, scripture is quite specific with reference to a believer, that is, one who is a baptized believer in the body of Christ, a believer in the sense of a Christian. And likewise, Scripture is very specific about an unbeliever. That's a person who is not a baptized believer, not in the body of Christ, and the, the term is not used to refer to one who has been baptized but who has fallen away. We have different terminology describing that. He would be described in terms of a, of, of a person that falls away, an apostate, something like that in language, for example, like Hebrews chapter 6 or chapter 10. 
right, I believe Danny has a question. In view of the discussion that you had on verse 12, where you mentioned that Paul said, I say, not the Lord, um, and also realizing that there are different camps that would say, well, you need to take the whole thing back to Matthew 19.9 and apply 1 Corinthians 7 to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9. My question is, since Paul said, I say not the Lord, is there even a need to give a reason uh, for the fact that he seems to say something different? Some brethren would say that because there's an unbeliever involved, the unbeliever is not even bound to any law of Christ for Christians in this dispensation. But since Paul is an inspired apostle, need he say why? Can't he just say, based on the fact that he is inspired, that if that's the case, then, then it stands without having to explain it to anyone in any dispensation? All right, I take the question is, um, <laughs> if uh, Paul being inspired, does he really need to give an explanation? Can't he simply say, this is it, as if that's from the Lord? And then uh, the, what is it, Danny? The, un, the unbeliever uh, is, is thereby not subject to these rules of marriage, the believer, for the believer? All right, so Danny's question is, does this passage stand as instruction about the unbeliever, regardless of what any other passage says? Uh, yes, I think, Danny, you're making a comment more than a question, but if I, <laughs> if I may uh, just go ahead and answer to you very briefly, uh, Danny has been a very good student here, and we appreciate his uh, good work. And by the way, Danny has really worked on this problem himself. He's... Uh, talked with me, talked with others, and done a lot of reading on this thing. Um, uh, to respond to what you're uh, uh, asking, uh, you know, uh, it seems to me very difficult to uh, go into all the whys and wherefores of, of what's not recorded and why Paul is trying to uh, deal with this. I think it's just very clear that he says to the others, the Lord didn't deal with this kind of situation, and the others, the rest, that refers to mixed marriage, a believer married to an unbeliever. The Lord wasn't talking about this. And then Paul goes on and authoritatively uh, gives his teaching on that, but uh, we can't read between the lines as to why all he's doing that. Since we're discussing marriage, we have a message from the nursery. This is to mom, Sean Starker's mother. Would you please go to the nursery? Uh, let's see, where did I believe? Eddie, where are you? Back here. Go ahead. I have a question that relates to a different aspect of the passage in question. In verse 14, Paul makes the point that the unbeliever is sanctified in the believer, and your observation on it was that rather than the unbeliever defiling the relationship, the believer sanctifies the relationship. Would it be a logical conclusion then to say that two believers married together obviously have a sanctified relationship? But because of what you said on verse 14, that two unbelievers would of necessity have an unsanctified relationship. Would that be a logical conclusion? All right. Do two unbelievers have an unsanctified relationship, whereas two believers have a sanctified one as well as one believer and one unbeliever? Well, we raise all kinds of questions that Paul never dealt with. Paul is dealing simply with the situation of a believer married to an unbeliever, and uh, the, the tendency would be perhaps with the believer, and here this unbeliever has never come across, he's never become a Christian, the tendency would, would be to say, well, look, uh, shall, I, you know, shall I continue to live with this a heathen man or woman, whatever, uh, with these vile practices in connection with heath heathenism? Isn't there something really unsanctifying about that relationship? And he says, no. Uh, the believer sanctifies that relationship. Now, uh, there are different opinions about what that means, but in some way, the believer sanctifies that relationship. Now, in the case of unbelievers, in the first place, in terms of salvation, etc., they are unsanctified, period. 
Now, uh, when you're dealing with their relationship, uh, then you, uh, I doubt that one can deduce from this what Paul might have reasoned in connection with the sanctity of the married relationship of unbelievers. We're on dangerous ground if we start uh, going into this territory. I wouldn't do it myself. Bill has another question, yes. It appears to me that there's too much silence here, and we believe where the Bible is silent, we're to be silent. Where it speaks, we're to speak. Wouldn't you assume that we should be more silent on this and not dig so deep into this? All right, I think the question is, are we asking too many questions? <laughs> Yes, I think we're asking too many questions, but <laughs> if your question is talking about uh, we should never really, you know, explore the depths of a passage of Scripture, uh, I want to unequivocally uh, um, go the opposite of what that question implies. Uh, far, far too long we have uh, superficially looked at passages and, and had superficial answers which in the end are not answers at all. They cause problems in the church. Uh, so far as I know, you know, the only way to get at truth is by means of looking at the text from every angle, uh, using all the exegetical tools possible uh, to explore this. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that everybody has to use all these tools when you study the Bible, but it does mean that if one is uh, making a critical interpretation of a passage, it's necessary to do that kind of work. And I think very frequently uh, our brotherhood, well-intentioned, uh, we say we speak where the scriptures speak, we're silent where the scriptures are silent, but many, time, many times we're not really speaking where the scriptures speak because we don't understand what the scriptures say. And we have to understand what the scriptures say before we can speak uh, where the Bible speaks. I think you have to uh, I believe one more question over here, and then we probably need to call this to a halt. Johnny Ramsey showed up in Wisconsin about that time. Didn't stay very long. He has a question. It seems that we forget sometimes that marriage came long before Christianity. God ordained marriage uh, centuries before there was Christianity. To infer that all of a sudden when Christianity came, God's divine law of marriage abruptly changed would be to violate several clear-cut teachings throughout the scriptures on the subject. To infer that because Matthew's account of what Jesus said, being different from Mark and Luke's account of what Jesus said, and then to say then Paul had as much right to say something different is to forget that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all deal with Christ, and Matthew just gave a fuller account of what Christ said. It didn't contradict what Mark and Luke said, though. All right, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul said he was an ambassador for Christ and spoke in Christ's stead. So when he spoke, he spoke with full authority as an ambassador of Christ. But can an ambassador contradict his king? And if the position that's been presented here be true, then we have a case of an ambassador contradicting the king. Jesus said, except it be, and said what the exception was. I don't believe there's any rule whereby an ambassador can change what Jesus said. Jesus didn't change. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all recorded what he said, and Matthew just gives a fuller account of what he said. Uh, by what right does an ambassador have the right to contradict his king? All right, the assumption of the question is that the position Dr. Lightfoot is taking makes Paul contradict Jesus. Neil? Well, I'm glad, Johnny, that you um, uh, brought this uh, aspect of the problem out. With reference to Matthew and Mark, uh, uh, Mark and Luke, of course Mark and Luke do not contradict Matthew. I made it very clear that Matthew gives additional teaching to Mark and Luke. If you just take Mark or if you just take Luke, there is no qualification 
It simply says that a, a person should not uh, divorce. No exception. We have, therefore, additional teaching in Matthew. We have the fuller account, any way we want to uh, present this. Of course, that's true. That's what I said. Now, when we come to 1 Corinthians 7, uh, let me just ask uh, this, not just to Johnny, but to everybody for thought. If Matthew, by giving additional teaching, does not contradict Mark and Luke, how is it and why is it that Paul, by giving additional teaching, all of a sudden contradicts Christ? This is not the subject, the ambassador, contradicting the king. This is one who is speaking with full authority in the in the capacity of the king being there. And this passage says, to the rest I say, now that's starting in verse 12, to the rest I say, not the Lord. Paul is very emphatic that what he says from verse 12 on is not from the Lord. This is additional teaching. I ask everybody to think about it. If Matthew can give additional teaching to Mark and Luke without contradicting Mark and Luke. Cannot Paul give additional teaching to what we have in Matthew without contradicting Matthew? Of course, I think he can. Thanks very much, Neil. We appreciate your scholarship and your answers. I think it would be appropriate here for us to end this with a prayer, and a fellow elder ought to hold up his fellow's hands. Dub Orr, would you come up? There's two or three announcements and lead us in a closing prayer. We have the elders' preacher's dinner at 445. All the tickets are gone, but we want all the food to be gone, so if you don't have a ticket, you're invited to show up somewhere toward the end of the line, and when all the ticket holders have gone through and there's still food left, you're invited to come and, and eat whatever's left. Uh, I think this is a good position for us to be in, actually. We've just been tremendously blessed with all kinds of visitors to this lectureship, probably one of the best attended we've had, and we deeply appreciate the presence of each one of you. We want to remind you of the lecture tonight at 7 o'clock and then at Biblical Forum, which will be here in this building at 8.45. I thought I had a lectureship program here. Ian Fair is one of the presenters of the Biblical Forum, and the other one is... Uh, oh, Gary Colvin from Alaska, and you might like very much to come and be present. We appreciate your presence and your interest and your patience, and we hope your lectureship continues to be a good one. And now, Dub Orr, Secretary of the Board of Abilene Christian University and an elder at South 11th and Willis will lead us in a closing prayer. Holy Lord, great eternal God, we are so filled with thanksgiving that you let Jesus live in this world. We are so thankful, Lord, that through your word we have come to know him. And we pray today that as we work with this word that we can allow it to infill us and to complete us and to make us whole from the crippled humans that we are. Thank you, Lord, that we can explore as we have today. Help us to have the capability and the wisdom to discern your will. And as we discern it, Father, help us to put it into practice. Help us, Father, to understand that in these difficult passages that we struggle. And we pray that we can have understanding and tolerance for those who may come to these scriptures and may perhaps come away with something a little different than what we individually find. 
But on those points, Father, that are so frequent in the scriptures where we can all agree, help us to unite and proceed joyously toward the victory that you promised us. We pray, Lord, that all of these who are here today will be empowered as they return to their homes to work with all the marriage problems that we encounter in our ministries. Help us, Lord, to look at each one individually. Help us to learn what lies in the people with whom we talk. And help us with your wisdom to try in each case to arrive at what is your will and to help them arrive at what is your will. But in all of this, Father, as we work with people that are so beset by problems in their marriages, help us to communicate love to them and help them to understand that through us, Jesus is loving them. And we pray that this power can be with us as we try to make your kingdom paramount in the world today. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this content and you want to see more of it, please leave a like on the video and be sure to leave a comment underneath telling us what you thought about the video. And please subscribe to our channel for more content like this. All right, I hope everyone has a great day.